Dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, on this day the Church begins the holy season of prayerful and penitential reflection. Our attention is specially directed to the holy sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. From ancient times, the season of Lent has been kept as a time of special devotion, self-denial, and humble repentance born of a faithful heart that dwells confidently on God's word and draws from it life and hope. With that in mind, this year our theme for our Lenten worship will focus on the journey, and our overall theme will be Return from Exile, a Lenten Journey. We begin our journey today wearing sackcloth and ashes while lamenting our sins. When we complete our journey, rising with Christ out of baptism, wearing robes of righteousness. Let us pray that our dear Father in heaven, for the sake of his beloved Son, and in the power of his Holy Spirit, might richly bless this Lenten tide for us, so that we may come to Easter with glad hearts and keep the feast in sincerity and truth. Silently, we take a moment now to prepare our hearts for worship. We stand and confess our sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you, therefore, all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our man-made garments of righteousness are but filthy rags, tainted with evil thoughts, unholy sexual desires, selfish wants, impure motives, jealousy, anger, envy, drunkenness, strife, idolatry, and much more. Therefore we are but dust, and to dust we shall return. But you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Repentance is your good gift, so that we are then able to rend our hearts and not our garments, and that you may create in us clean hearts, hearts of flesh, not of stone. Give us firm trust in your promises made to us for the sake of Jesus, who endured our temptation yet without sin, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we listen to God's word together.
Our Old Testament lesson is from the second chapter of Joel. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your hand, your left hand, know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and Pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will, will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces and their, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We invite the young people of the congregation forward at this time for the children's message. Hello, everyone. 
Good afternoon. This is a very unusual church service because it's called Ash Wednesday. And on Ash Wednesday, one of the things we do, of course, is called the imposition of ashes. In other words, as people come forward for Holy Communion, it's also a chance for them to come forward and, you can do this too, have ashes placed on your forehead or on your hand or wrist area as a reminder of a couple of things. The first thing is that it's a reminder of our sin. So let me talk about that for a moment. If you want, you can kind of look here and see what the ashes look like. They're black. They're dirty. If someone were to sneeze right now, they would go flying, and it would be a mess. So I'm usually pretty careful not to get people too messy when I put the cross on their forehead. It doesn't always go as planned, but we usually are pretty careful. So we have these ashes. Now imagine for a moment that it wasn't just your forehead that got ashes, that it got all over you. And if you came home like that, what do you think the, the message you would receive would be? It'd be, you need to go clean up, right? <laughs> now, now imagine if instead of going to clean up, you said, you know, I, I, I'm too smart for that. I don't want to bother cleaning up. So I'm just going to put on some more clothes to hide all the ashes. What do you think would happen then? Yes. Right, so you would have a worse problem. Not only would you be covered in ashes, but all your clothes would be covered in ashes also. It would be a huge mess. You know, the more you try to cover up ashes like this, the worse it gets. And it's the same with our sin. When we disobey God and do things that hurt other people, when we try to hide that before God and try to pretend before God like we're not so sinful, it only gets us in a worse mess. There's only one thing to do, and that's to confess our sins to God, to say we're, we're sorry for our sins, and also to trust in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sin. So today, we have ashes that are placed on us to remind us of our sin. And I say, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But that's not the only thing. Because when we put these ashes on people, whether it's on your forehead or hand or wrist, we do so in the shape of a cross to remind us that it is on the cross of Jesus and only through his death on the cross that we have forgiveness. But we know that we do have forgiveness. We know that all of our sins are washed away. The, the, the ashes, as dirty as they are, as hard as it is to wash them away, why we know that only Jesus can wash away our sins, and he washes them away completely so that they are no more. And we thank God for that, and that is why we have ashes on Ash Wednesday. So if you could fold your hands and bow your heads and please repeat after me and the congregation can join in also. We pray, dear Jesus, dear Jesus we, are reminded we are reminded of our sins today. Our sins today. Thank, you Thank you for dying on the cross. So my, sins so my sins could be washed away. Could be washed away. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. You can return to your places now. And as a congregation, we'll continue with our special theme hymn for our Lenten series, Return from Exile, called We Are Exiles from the Garden.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Clothes are pretty good, right? The clothes that we wear. Sophie Kinsella, in Confessions of a Shopaholic, wrote, I love new clothes. If everyone could just wear new clothes every day, I reckon depression wouldn't exist anymore. And Ellen Montgomery wrote in Anne of Green Gables, it is ever so easier to be good if your clothes are fashionable. <laughs> we do love our clothes, do we not? If you go to the Mall of America or some other big mall like that, you will see one shop after another, each one selling a different style or type of clothing. Imagine if there was only one store that sold only one kind of clothing. I think we would have a revolt on our hands. How would people express their own personal style? How would people express their own individual individuality? How would we strut our stuff? What would we do without our fancy duds and our pretty coverings? Pretty coverings. They may be beautiful, but what is the real purpose of the clothes that we wear? The easy answer is that, well, it helps us to be modest, to cover up our nakedness, but there is more to it than that. In scriptures, the coverings that we see there have another purpose. The garments and coverings and clothes that are mentioned in scripture from the very first pages of the Bible are there to do one thing, and that is to cover our shame. This began with Adam and Eve. They took the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and suddenly they realized there in the Garden of Eden that they were naked. They knew their sin, their guilt, their disobedience, and this is the knowledge that they longed for and the unfortunate knowledge that they gained. They became all too aware that they needed, they had to hide from God if God would show up later on walking in the Garden of Eden. So, they sewed fig leaves together so that maybe, just maybe, God wouldn't notice that they had disobeyed. <laughs> if you put it that way, it doesn't seem like such a good plan, does it? Adam and Eve saying, oh, we're going to be super inconspicuous. We're going to put on these clothes that we never even wore before. And God will not catch on. He will not notice a thing. The fig leaves were a dead giveaway. And not only that, it just didn't work. Fig leaves were the wrong kind of garment. It's sad to say that things haven't really gotten any better. Oh, the clothes that we have are much fancier than fig leaves now and probably more practical. We have all kinds of fashion in our world today. But if anything, the sin that we try to cover up has only gotten worse and worse, and worse. Add to that all of our rationalizations and our excuses and our attempts at self-righteousness. Our man-made garments are nothing but filthy rags, Scripture reminds us. The shame remains. If the desires of our heart were laid bare for all to see, we would all truly be ashamed. Evil thoughts, sensual desires, selfish wants, impure 
motives, jealousy, anger, drunkenness, strife, idolatry. Do I need to go on any more? This is the condition of our heart. This is our inner being that we try to hide with our man-made clothing. Yet, man is not able, man is not capable to hide the truth of our sin from God. We cannot disguise from him the way our hearts really are. No matter how hard we try to be good on the outside, for the Lord sees. We may try to fool others. We may be fooled by others, but the Lord God sees the condition of our hearts. From dust we came, and to dust we shall return. What does this mean? It's a way of expressing the truth that when we were born into this world, we were born sinners. And our whole life's journey is a journey back to the ground, back to dust. All of our attempts to cover up sin, every effort to undo it, always brings us back to but one thing, and that's dust. We are creatures of dust, and when we die, our bodies become dust once again. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return. There's no getting around it. It is into such a star sorry state of spiritual affairs that the prophet Joel speaks. He's speaking because the people of Israel have wandered away from God. They have been unfaithful in word and deed. They have sought after other so-called gods. And as scripture puts it, they have played the harlot. So the Lord says that he will turn them over to disaster. They will be oppressed and they will be downtrodden. They will suffer want and they will weep in their distress. What is there then for the prophet Joel to say? What else can he say? He cries out, rend your hearts, your hearts, and not your garments. The ancient tradition of rending your garments was to express your terrible anxiety and distress, thereby revealing your state of sorrow. However, Joel knows that the rending of garments will only reveal the problem, a corrupt and sinful heart. So, while a torn garment shows the problem, a torn heart begins to heal the problem. This is echoed in Psalm 51, where King David tells us the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So where does that leave us? It leaves us at our Lenten theme, return from exile. We all need to do that. We all need to repent. We all need to return to the Lord from the exile imposed upon us by our own sin. We know our sin. It is ever before us. We know that by our own strength we cannot return from our sin exile. We know that we cannot return to the presence of God these ashes that we will wear, they remind us of the condition of our hearts. Nevertheless, ashes in the sign of a cross remind us of a gracious and a merciful God. We who are helpless and hopeless sinners are told this, return to the Lord your God, 
for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. While ashes show our sin, ashes in the sign of the cross show us the true nature of God's redeeming love. It is so strange that the cross would do such a thing. The cross was an instrument of torture and death. Yet that very cross that was an instrument of torture and death through the death of Jesus cleansed our hearts and exchanged our garments. For there, on the cross, Jesus was crucified in our place. There, they stripped his clothing from him. The sinless Son of God nailed naked to a tree in our stead. In that moment, he who knew no sin became sin for us. We attempt to cover up our sin, but Jesus revealed it so that he could wash it away with his blood. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Ashes in the sign of a cross. Behold the cross. Look at the cross. I was reminded of a sermon at Christ Lutheran long before I came here where the pastor got up and was preaching from the back of the church. I believe it was Pastor Crown. And he had everybody look at the cross for the full length of the sermon. So behold the cross. For it was on the cross that a gracious and merciful God offered up his only begotten Son so that the sin that has exiled us from the presence of God might be washed away and you and I might be brought back to God. This is our return from exile. This is what our Lenten journey together is all about. And where does this journey end? Actually, not at the cross. Not even at the empty tomb. The journey ends in the courts of heaven. Listen to the words of St. John as he describes heaven's scene. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Picture in your mind's eye that great throng, that multitude, waving palm branches in the air as they worship their Savior. Note that they are clothed in white robes. These are no fig leaves that they wear. They are not adorned with filthy rags. Instead, they are clothed in white robes, robes that have been cleansed in the blood of the Lamb made clean. Their sackcloth garments have been exchanged for robes of righteousness. There in heaven, the sackcloth and the ashes are gone. And Jesus gives us new clothes, robes of righteousness that have been washed in his blood. This is the final image of our redemption shown to us in Scripture. Blackened, corrupt hearts covered by fig leaves and animal hides. Such is the cause of our exile. Exiled from the presence of God, we adorn our foreheads with ashes. 
We come before God with repentant hearts. And God is gracious and merciful. God provides his son in our place. Jesus endures the cross in our stead. Blood is shed, holy and precious blood that washes away all of our sin. Our hearts are now restored. Our sackcloth and our ashes are exchanged for garments of salvation. The exile is over. The journey is finished. We are returned to the presence of God. And we rejoice with a joy that will last forever. Amen. Let us stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we worship the Lord through our offerings. Also, we invite the children to come forward now and receive their Lenten passports and stickers for this Ash Wednesday service. We invite you to stand for the prayer of the church. On this occasion, when we especially remember our sin and our mortality, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Merciful Father, your Son was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Give your baptized children strength to withstand persecution and temptation. Lord, in your mercy. Father, your Son heard the devil twist the words of Holy Scripture and yet was not deceived. Give us pastors who will preach and teach your word accurately. And give us ears, minds, and hearts to receive that word for our own defense, endurance, and confession of our true Christian faith. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, King of the universe, you have chosen to provide for all people through earthly government and commerce. Give us rulers and business people who conduct all affairs within your good and gracious law, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Because this is pleasing in your sight and you desire all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, Lord, in your mercy. Sure. Almighty God, there are many who would gladly extinguish your gospel and your people. Bless our enemies and cause them to live with us in peace. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, you know the trials and the suffering of your children. We ask you especially to care for our loved ones. We also pray for all who mourn for a loved one. And we pray for all who mourn for our dear sister in Christ, Betty Matter. And we pray that as the family and loved ones gather this Friday at 11 for her funeral, that you use God's word to comfort them. And that in the days and weeks to come, the family of God would circle around itself with arms of love to support this family and all who are in need. 
Lord, in your mercy. Father, your Son gave his living and life-giving body and blood for us to eat and drink, that through it forgiveness of sin, life and salvation would crowd out the death that we have inherited. Give us deep and abiding joy, even during this penitential season. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body to, and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated and are invited forward to the sacrament of the altar. As we mentioned during the children's message, you, as you come forward, may wish to receive uh, the imposition of ashes as an option. If you don't want them, just keep going. But uh, if you do want the imposition of ashes, just stop in front of myself or the elder who is doing that. And uh, then after that, you can continue on upward and receive communion and then return to your places. May God bless us as we gather this evening with repentant hearts, trusting in the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Emily, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We invite you to stand. May this true body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep you and strengthen you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing for our closing hymn, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness. We invite you to join us for the soup supper in the fellowship hall uh, after the service. And uh, thank you to the puppets and all who are helping with it. Uh, there is a suggested donation that will support the puppets as well. Um, please join me also in a mealtime prayer as we have many people who will be headed over to the fellowship hall. We pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. And, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Amen. We sing our closing hymn. May God be with you and bless you during our Lenten journey together.